So, um, yeah, I'll be talking about some of the computational side of locally symmetric spaces. Um, so most of what I'm talking about today is joint work with Avner Ash and Paul Gunnels. We've been collaborating a long time. Uh, more recently, I've gotten to know Don Yasaki, and we're doing um, things together. Also, I'll be talking about uh, some joint work between myself and Bob McPherson. We have a new algorithm for computing HEC operators in certain cases, which I'll tell you about. Well, okay, a standard opening, I suppose, for this conference. Let uh, G be a connected semi-simple algebraic group defined over Q. Regular G, it's real points. Choose a maximum compact subgroup K. So X, G mod K is the symmetric space. And um, let gamma be an arithmetic subgroup of G. So the main example for this talk will be um, G is SLNR. I can do it this way. G is SLNR, K, SLNR. And uh, gamma will be one of the standard congruence subgroups. Um, a lot of what I say today will work where G is the restriction of scalars for GLN for any number field K, ring of integers OK. Now, I just said uh, semi-simple and GL is reductive. What that means is in the um, symmetric space for these uh, GLN cases, there's in general going to be extra factors coming from the units of OK. And you know, one computes with them, one deals with them. So this latter case is the one where for real quadratic K, you've got the world of Hilbert modular forms. For the imaginary quadratic fields, you've got the world of the Bianchi groups and so on. OK, well, uh, I'll always be taking my uh, G so that the symmetric space is contractible. And gamma acts properly discontinuously on X. So this means if X is torsion free, then uh, X mod gamma is a K pi 1. And so the group cohomology of gamma is the cohomology of the topological space x mod gamma. Then, of course, if you're in that setting, you can also get local systems going. So um, let m be a rational, finite dimensional representation of g. Over a field f, um, a lot of the time today, f will be of characteristic 0, like c. Um, actually, in a lot of what we do in practice, we compute over finite fields or prime fields. Um, well, given such a representation of gamma, that gives a local system on the, uh, on the x mod gamma. And so we define cohomology with uh, twisted coefficients. And then you know, if gamma is not torsion free, if it has torsion, you look at the orders of all the torsion elements of gamma. And uh, equalities like 1 are still true as long as the characteristic of f doesn't divide the order of any uh, element of phi down order in gamma. I, I do want to say that. Uh, Ash and Gunnels and I also face the case where uh, the characteristic of f does divide <laughs> the order of torsion elements of gamma. We got at least two of our papers are devoted to that. So I will uh, be talking about that as we get to that later on. OK, so a major result of the last few years is, um, is uh, yeah, I like here at the top, that the, the cohomology of the space as a whole decomposes into the uh, sum of a cuspidal part plus parts coming over the classes of associate proper parabolic subgroups, Q parabolic subgroups. So I think of this as we have the Borel circumpactification of X mod gamma, and the parts of the big direct sum are coming from the uh, components there at infinity. And then the cuspidal part is you know, you know, related to the interior. So, um, so the projects we've done can uh, I can uh, explain them in part by referring to this equation. So we compute the terms in this equation explicitly in cases, a variety of cases I'll list. We compute the heck operators on the left side using algorithms I'll be telling you about. Um, once you, uh, you break the left hand side up into heck eigenspaces under, well, all the a finite number of operators that you can compute, and that those uh, eigenspaces, you can uh, hope to identify them as the different pieces on the right, and we do, you know, at least at the level of computation, do identify them. I'll be bringing Galois representations into the um, picture and attaching them uh, to the classes, the cohomology classes. And uh, we do this both for uh, non-torsion like characteristic zero classes and for torsion classes, as, as I'll explain. All right, but um, like I say, my main example for today is um, just like you know, SLNZ and congruent subgroups of SLNZ. And, um, there, for us, everything is very geometric. It all comes down to lattices in Rn. So let me uh, go over that briefly. So um, G equals SLNR. OK, yeah, SLNR, matrix of determinant 1. So its rows form 
a basis of Rm, normalized to determinant 1. So I think of G as the space of determinant 1 bases. Now, uh, when you act by SLNZ on the left, you're forming linear combinations of those rows, of integer linear combinations, in an invertible way. So you're going to form all the linear combinations. You're going to get the lattice generated by that basis. So G mod SLNZ is the space of all lattices. Uh, take a congruent subgroup, G mod gamma can be thought of as a space of lattices with extra structure. You know, say, uh, if, if you want to play games, you can color the points um, of your lattice in some way. That if, if n is the level, then you can color them in some way, depending on capital N in the two directions. Um, the choice of maximal compact subgroup comes down in this picture to a choice of inner product on all the lattices. You know, basically fix the standard up product. That's SONR. And so then G mod K, the symmetric space, is the space of all lattice spaces mod rotations. It's a, a lattice basis where two bases are considered equivalent if they differ by rotations. So then finally, X mod gamma on the other side is a space of lattices with extra structure modulo the rotations. So sometimes I'll be talking about lattices today and sometimes about a basis. A lattice basis is really a lattice together with a distinguished basis of the lattice. Right. Um, so a few natural uh, definitions for lattice L. The arithmetic minimum is the smallest length of all non-zero lengths that are attained in the lattice. The minimal vectors of L are all the vectors that attain that minimal non-zero length. And uh, Avner Ash introduced the term uh, that L is well-rounded if its minimal vectors uh, are enough to span Rn. So think of the classical root lattices, for example. Um, and then we let W a subspace of X. X was the space of lattice spaces. So W is the space of all bases of well-rounded lattices. So um, I'll state this theorem and then be doing examples of it. So um, Ash approved at, in a series of papers in the late 70s um, that first of all, there's an SLNZ equivariant deformation retraction from space X down onto this W. So we call W the well-rounded retract. Um, the dimension of W is n minus 1 less than x. I mean, yeah, n minus 1 is the dimension of the maximal torus, split torus in this case. So you're, that's the dimension you're retracting away. That dimension is called the virtual cohomological dimension, because if gamma is torsion-free, then it's the cohomological dimension. It's the uh, largest dimension that has non-trivial cohomology in that case. Virtual ref refers to going to a yeah, torsion-free subgroup. Um, more interestingly, W is a locally finite regular cell complex, and the cells are characterized by coordinates, like integer vector coordinates, of their minimal vectors with respect to the basis. So um, recall, a, a point in X is a lattice with a distinguished basis, and um, this lattice is going to have minimal vectors, enough to span Rn by definition of W. But you got your minimal vectors and you got some distinguished basis, so your minimal vectors will have integer coordinates on that distinguished basis. And I'm forming a topological space by letting the bases slowly move into form, but as the basis moves into forms, there'll be families where the coordinates of the minimal vectors, the coordinates remain constant even as the uh, things vary around. Like, take two vectors of equal length and let their angle differ while they retain equal length. So the open cells are the loci where the set of integer value coordinates remain the same. And when you go from a cell to a smaller face, you're, going, you're adding more minimal vectors. I'll do examples in a second. Um, uh, the final thing to say about this is that it's sort of W mod gamma is a finite cell complex. So once you've modded out by SL and Z or by subgroups, there's only finitely many inequivalent cells. Um, I'm going to state all this for the case of SLNZ, but in fact, in, in a slightly later paper, Ash did it for all number fields K. That's the case of restriction of scalars from GLN K down to Q. OK, so a conclusion is that um, the cohomology of the congruent subgroups gamma with any finite dimensional local coefficient system can be computed in finite terms. So I've got a finite cell complex. and and uh, n is a representation of gamma, so I can work out the local system, and I can um, just do the computations by the elementary methods. Um, 
Boy, there's a lot of sweat going into what I just said, it's especially the last few years I've been involved in making sure the local systems you know, worked right, always worked right in all cases, and I've, I feel confident my code now is pretty bug free. So. Um, and we're also, um, we're involved in very large computations here. So this, this poor little laptop, I'm very good at clogging its memory, and I think it's only got, I think this one's only got eight gigs. So I, I can easily clog the memory of that. I'm now using a bigger computer at the Princeton Applied Math Department that I've got them nicely full of sort of 30 gigs floating around right now, trundling along. But um, so, so over the years, I've had to look for many time and memory tricks to improve things. I, I don't think that's the thing for me to go into in detail today. So I imagine these slides will be posted, so I put them in Appendix 1. OK. But so on this previous slide, I told you about the well-rounded retract. But now let me tell you geometrically how it works. How do you retract an arbitrary lattice or lattice basis and make it well-rounded? So uh, it's a beautifully simple idea. Um, you, you take a lattice, look for whichever um, vector is, is, the, uh, sh is the shortest non-zero vector, a vector of minimal length in the lattice. If there's more than one, there's a tie, just pick one arbitrarily. Okay. Pick, fix that vector and fix the real line, one-dimensional line, through that vector. Um, remember, we fixed a maximal compact before, so we have a notion of a perpendicular. We've got a dot product. So to this line, I can take the perpendicular n minus one-dimensional subspace. And I can shrink in by homothetes, by a uniform change of scale in those remaining n minus one perpendicular dimensions. So, so like a cylinder. Okay. One point of the lattice is fixed, and in a cylinder perpendicular to that line, everything's shrinking in. So sooner or later, a second vector is going to come in and be tied for shortest length with the first. When that happens, that will, in general, determine a plane. OK, now, fix that plane, recompute the perpendicular, which is n minus 2 dimensional, shrink in in the n minus 2 dimensional, keep going, and eventually you'll get a basis of minimal vectors, and that makes your thing well-rounded. So uh, I have a little movie of this for SL2. Let's see. Um, so um, well-rounded retract demos, a retraction in two dimensions. I have to bear with this computer. It's, it's trying very hard to accelerate my dots. And it um, sometimes it works a little. Oh, it's pretty fast today. Right. OK, so that's what it does. So um, here's what I've done. I've picked an arbitrary lattice in the plane. We've said that uh, it's g mod k, so we don't care if we rotate the lattice. So identify the shortest vector that's red in this picture. And uh, you can rotate the shortest vector so it lies along the x-axis. I'm, I'm, well, I know I said I was scaled by determinant 1, but you might as it's equivalent to scale so that the shortest vector has length 1. So I'll do that. OK. Then. Um, Right. Yeah, I don't know why I turned gray. This um, <laughs> here's the <laughs> next closest vector, <laughs> right? And when I push the button, the thing, as you saw before, the thing shrinks perpendicularly down. Okay, until this vector lands on here, and then I have a basis of shortest vector, so I stop. It's it's well rounded. Okay, um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, picture of the upper half plane of modular reaction of SL2Z by linear fractional transformations. So you'll recognize this domain outlined by those three lines. So this is a visual proof that, of course, that's the fundamental domain for SL2Z. <laughs> because put the shortest vector at the point 1, 0, you're going to have some, oh, there we go, they're going to have some row of dots. <laughs> and um, the dots are with one apart. <laughs> I'm making it work hard. The, the dots are with one apart. so one of them is going to lie between plus or minus a half horizontally, and they're all outside the unit circle until they like fall down and touch it. So therefore, this curve region must be the fundamental domain. Okay. Okay. So um, get out of that. Great um, presentation. All right. So. Uh, Here's a picture summarizing some of what I've just said. If, if we're in the SL2 case, then x is, of course, the classical upper half plane. So the well-rounded retract 
as a whole, it's all these, uh, this graph, I mean, the shaded region is the fundamental domain I just talked about, but that's just in the picture for a show. W is this graph, that edge, that edge, that edge. It's a, it's a tree, of course, Sarah wrote the book, Arbre. it's a tree. <laughs> um, every vertex is a valence three. The, uh, the vertices all come from the hexagonal lattice, Z adjoined, the cubit of unity, and they represent different bases in it. The edge centers all come from the square lattice and represent different bases in it. Okay. And so SL2Z acts on this tree. Um, I couldn't uh, resist. For n equals 3, the complex is made of something called the Soule cube. So th this is a, a solid three-dimensional cube. It's, it's not a cube. It's a cube. You chop off every opposite corner to make a triangular chopped off face. So uh, Christophe Soule's thesis was, um, I think it was entitled, On the Cohomology of SL3Z. He worked it out. And uh, he used a retract not quite like Ash's. I believe Ash was inspired by Soule's retract to define the well-rounded retract and then so on. Um, so the, for SL3, the things, you take this cube, you take this block, you glue a tree-like structure together. Three of these Soule cubes meet at every hexagonal face. Four of the Soule cubes you meet, meet at every triangular face. And the vertices are the A3 root lattice, which is also the D3 root lattice, which is also the lattice that the oranges form at the supermarket, if, if they're well laid out. Okay. Um, as long as I'm here, I'll mention a theorem that uh, Ash and I proved back in 96. In fact, the well-rendered retraction extends to the borel sarre compactification, X bar. And in fact, it's a composition of geodesic flows away from the boundary components. So when I say, uh, you know, fix a line, take the perpendicular subspace, and shrink in like a cylinder, that is, in fact, the geodesic flow. So, yeah, it's the action of a torus sort of on the, on the other side from the side that G is acting on. So, um, and the, the dimension uh, that you're retracting away is n minus 1. So, in general, you do n minus 1 different ge geodesic <coughs> flows. Um, okay. Well, so, um, so that was cohomology, but I want to bring um, the Hecker correspondences into the story. So, um, also, say let L be a prime, take a K f fixed integer from 1 through N. Um, I'm doing congruent subgroups of SLN right now. For this first discussion, let's just take SLN itself for simplicity. So once again, X mod gamma is the space of lattices. Um, OK, now that this prime L and the K have been fixed, you know, given a lattice L, there are only finitely many lattices M contained in L where the quotient is isomorphic to Z mod LZ to the kth power, the basic Smith normal form stuff. So the, um, the most, uh, the, perhaps the cleanest definition of a HECA operator is to find the HECA correspondence, TLK, to be the one-to-many map from X mod gamma to itself, where you take the point L to the set of points M. And uh, I'm sure everyone knows when is level N. You, uh, you have to check how M interacts with the level structure you chose. So you need to modify this definition when L divides N. I won't go into that now. Um, I couldn't resist sticking in an example. Um, which, um, I'm teaching a course in modular forms a semester, so I did the following example. Um, T2, 1 in the plane has three sublattices, which are um, the checkerboard, the horizontal rows, and the vertical rows. T3, 1 comes from four sublattices, horizontals, sort of slope a third, slope minus a third, and verticals. And then it's so a beautiful, you take intersections of the three up there with the four there in all possible ways, and you get exactly the standard enumeration of the 12 lattices that, uh, that you'll find, say, in Sarah's book for the heck operator at six. So just each of these is the intersection of the ones across from it. Okay. Well, um, okay, a, a definition that will uh, generalize and perhaps be more familiar goes as follows. Um, let T, this little t, be um, a diagonal matrix with um, k l's at the end of n minus k ones. Um, I need the congruent subgroup gamma naught. I need gamma naught n k. That means um, it, it's congruent mod n to this upper block triangular thing, k by k down here, 
and the remaining n minus k by n minus k up here. So therefore, gamma naught of n means gamma naught of n1, and my normalization it is, has a row of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 star at the bottom. Right. Then this picture is the picture of a HEC operator. It's two maps. It's a x mod gamma downstairs and upstairs x mod a subgroup gamma intersect this standard gamma naught of LK. So the, you know, x mod a smaller group gets you more points upstairs. So there are two maps down. R is just sort of the obvious one, send a coset to a coset. S is send a coset to um, stick a T in there on the inside. Um, of course, this when you work this out algebraically, it becomes the standard double coset story. And so then the in this definition, the HECA correspondence is the one-to-many map where you pick a point downstairs, take its inverse image by L, which is several points, and push them all down by S, which in, in general will be the, the same number of points. They all go to different places. Then the HECA operator is on cohomology as you dualize that, you pull back by S and then push forward by R, your R lower star, so finally many things are adding up at each place. Again, coding this up, with a twisted coefficient system is a bit pain with that, but that's one of my achievements of this past spring, so I'm happy with it. Um, okay. these, um, these operators taken over all L and all K generate, as you know, a commutative algebra, the heck algebra. All right, well, so um, I've been talking about how to compute cohomology, but computing heck operators by these cellular methods like is much harder at first sight or doesn't work at first sight. So here's um, an example of why. I've just repeated this picture of the, uh, of the well-rounded retract for SL2. So I've said there's, um, say let's just take the heck operator for at two, T21. I've said it comes from sending one lattice to three lattices, horizontal, checkerboard, and vertical. If you um, chase through the story of linear fractional transformations, um, one of those three is the linear fractional transformation, just z goes to 2z. Like that's the matrix 2, 0, 0, 1. So on the upper half plane, that fixes the origin, which is down here, and uh, scales everything up by a factor of 2. Like you know, circles go to circles twice as round, twice, twice as big. So what does that do to this circle, little circular arc here? It sends it to a bigger arc that starts halfway over this edge arcs over here and ends halfway over this edge. So first of all, the, the lesson is HEC operators don't carry our cell complex into itself. It carries it to another place. And that's only one of the three components of the HEC operator. The, uh, the other two linear, excuse me, linear fractional transformations would sort of go downwards. Um, well, I have a well-rounded retraction. So if my cell complex is carried to something not contained in itself, why not just retract back? Well, but you see what's going to happen if this, if this larger arc starts halfway over here, the geodesic flow goes straight down and it's going to land here. So I've suddenly introduced the notion of half an edge. Yeah. So for HECA operators, if you try to do them cellularly at least, it, you, have, you always have to do something like take your existing cells and break them in half. And you know, if it's not L equals 2, you have to break them in tiny pieces, or at least this is this is what one has to face. This is what one has to overcome. How to, how to avoid fractions of cells. All right. Um, so I'm describing what Ash and Gunnels and I have done. So um, to, to avoid those geometric problems, we work with something called the Sharbley complex, which is more purely algebraic. So uh, probably less familiar to this audience, so, but I'll, um, some aspects are familiar. So I'll take a few slides to go through it quickly. Um, so I'm going to construct a, a complex with a more algebraic flavor. Um, for each k greater than or equal to zero, I'm going to consider n by n plus k matrices, a, and they're going to have rational entries. I'm doing the example of SLNZ. So you think like rectangular matrices, starting with square matrices and getting wider and wider. So um, the Sharblies in degree k are um, formal z-linear combinations of symbols you put such a matrix in brackets. Um, a, a matrix in brackets is called a Sharbly. And you see from this footnote, um, it was introduced by Lee and Sharba in a paper on 
homage and commage of Congress subgroups, and of course they didn't call it Sharblies, but our friendly Rudolf called them Sharblies. Um, okay, so what's the difference between a matrix and the symbol where it's in brackets? The, the symbols obey a few uh, algebraic rules as follows. First of all, permuting the co two columns of A multiplies the sign of the symbol by minus one, in general, the sign of the permutation. Um, the columns of A are sort of like vectors. You think of them as vectors you might want to make primitive in Zn. So multiplying a column of A by a non-zero scalar doesn't change anything. And finally, um, you want them to have full rank. So as soon as the rank of A drops to less than n, just identify that symbol with zero. So um, that's a group for each k. You put on a rather um, a familiar boundary operator, the uh, you know, alternating sum of like omissions in each place. And then this complex is called the Sharbly complex. Now, um, part of the interest of the Sharbly complex is that it connects to the Steinberg module and therefore to the whole geometry of the borel serre So, uh, well, as follows. Um, the, the, I'm going to introduce the Tietz building TN. I, I guess I'm saying the Tietz building for SLN over Q. So this is the simplicial complex where um, you fix the vector space Q to the N. Each subspace of Q to the N yeah, non-zero, not the full thing. Each subspace is a point in a simplicial complex, and each flag in Q to the N is a simplex in the simplicial complex. Um, so according to the solomon tietz theorem, this is homotopic uh, to a bouquet of spheres. It's going to be a, the spheres of dimension N minus 2. And then the Steinberg module is the homology, you throw away degree 0, so the reduced homology of the Tietz building. Now, um, if, if um, I like to think of this geometrically in terms of the borel serre compactification. So the, the borel serre compactification, not talking about X bar mod gamma, but X bar itself, is, is a, you're gluing on boundary components exactly corresponding to the elements of the Tietz building, and in a, in a degree reversing way. So the, the points of the Tietz building are the biggest boundary components of the Borel serre, they're like, yeah, sort of maximal parabolics in their various shapes. The, uh, the biggest simplices of the Tietz building are the Borel subgroups and so on. So, um, and b the Borel serre duality theorem, say if gamma is torsion free, is that the Steinberg module is the dualizing module. So when you, in formulas like this, like the homology of gamma with coefficients in M tensor the Steinberg, you expect it, and in fact it is a Borel serre theorem, you, uh, that it's going to be isomorphic to the cohomology of gamma with coefficients in M. And um, so then the reason for bringing in Sharblies is that, in for the torsion free case, the Sharblies are a resolution of the Steinberg module. So the, the, me and Sharber proved that the, uh, the Sharblies, well, if I don't say torsion free, then I can at least say it's an exact sequence of GL and Q modules. If I do say torsion free, then the um, these Sharblies are a gamma-free resolution of the Steinberg module. Um, I mean, if gamma has torsion, then you sort of you lose. They're not even projective modules because it messes up at those points. But so for now, let's say torsion-free. So you know, therefore, I'm interested in the Sharbly homology where I tensor the Sharbly complex as I star with M rather than you know. So because it's a resolution, it should compute this. So the um, the bottom line is there's. I've now introduced, I guess, about six different cohomology and homologies. And if gamma's torsion free, they're all the same. <laughs> so the, the group cohomology, the cohomology of the topological space X mod gamma, cohomology of the Brasser, the cohomology of the retract of X mod gamma, and then the Steinberg homology is the same, of course, with a reversal of degrees, and the Sharbly homology. Then um, by spectral sequence arguments, <coughs> These things are all the same also if you're working over a field of characteristic uh, P, and P does not divide the order of any torsion element of gamma. Um, so we often do that. But as I mentioned, well, we wanted to face the case where P does divide the order of the torsion. So we spent the projects I'm talking about today are mostly for SL4Z. For SL4Z, the torsion elements are of order 2, 3, and 5, or, or you know. Combinations of those. So, uh, so the primes we have to worry the most about are two, three, and five. And um, so the 
it becomes, of course, sort of technical, which of these things are now isomorphic to which others, and two is the worst, of course. So um, I, I put it in Appendix 2. I don't think I'll dwell on it here. All right. Um, but now, OK. So I've, the Sharpley complex is this very large object that you, know, you can't compute with it in finite terms, because after all, I'm talking about all possible rectangular matrices with rational entries. That's it's infinite. So I, I've got to get my cell complex involved in here somehow. I want to somehow map my cell complex into this more infinite thing. So um, the cells of W, as I said before, are characterized by their minimal vectors with respect to the, like, the basis that the point of W carries. So those minimal vectors are in coordinates are a bunch of vectors in Zn. So that's like a bunch of columns in a matrix of Q to the n. So that's a Sharpley. So I, I take my, um, the minimal vectors that characterize my cell. Each cell becomes a Sharpley. So I can call this the well-rounded Sharpley sum complex. And for um, the well-rounded retract is dual, dual to work of that Voronoi did. So we also call it the Voronoi Sharpley sub complex. Now, there's a big problem here. I have to be very careful here, because what I just said doesn't always work, because it's not always a complex. So let me, um, let me explain. I can't draw a picture of the D4 root lattice, because it's in four dimensions. But uh, as you may know, the D4 root lattice has 12 minimal vectors, well, 12 plus or minus pairs of minimal vectors. Um, if you try to, so imagine a lattice with a sphere in the center of radius 1 and 12 plus or minus pairs of points on the sphere. If you try to deform the D4 lattice by epsilon in some direction, keeping it a lattice, it turns out you can't do it while letting 11 of the pairs remain on the sphere. The most you can do is have 9 of the pairs remain on the sphere. Um, those 12 points actually descend from Z4 into RP3, where there are classical configuration called Ray's configuration studied in the 19th century. And by looking at the projective geometry of Ray's configuration, you can see it. It's, it's in Hilbert and Kohn-Vossen's book. You can see that the perturbations, you wouldn't be able to get anything less than, I mean, more than nine if, when you deform it. Well, so um, in terms of the Sharblies, that means I'm saying there's a Sharbly with 12 columns whose boundary has only nine columns. So that's like leaping three ahead in the Sharpley complex, so you can't do that. OK. Fortunately, we don't have to, because um, if you chase through all the, well, first of all, for n equals 2 and 3, it turns out um, the uh, well-rounded Sharpley is always embedded as a subcomplex. For n equals 4, they don't, and it's really because of this Reyes configuration I mentioned. It's the only problem for n equals 4. But um, we're most, the reason we can work with this is we're mostly interested in the cuspidal range of cohomology. So the, for SL4, the cuspidal range of cohomology is H4 and H5. That's, that's 1 and 2 down from the top dimension H6. Those are Sharblies of degrees 1 and 2. And it turns out they're very l low Sharblies. The, the, these matrices of size 12 are much higher ways. So the bottom line is we don't have to worry about them for the point of view of cuspidal cohomology. All right. Um, now, the, from the point of view of Heck operators, the whole reason to go to the Sharblies is the Sharblies are very flexible. Or maybe, what should I say? The Sharblies are very friable. They're, you know, it's rational matrices. So do take lattices to some kind of sublattices. You're taking matrices to other matrices of much larger determinants. That's OK. It's all rational. So you, the Heck operators act naturally, but the Heck correspondences act naturally on the Sharblies. And at least in the torsion-free cases, I've argued that the, um, all these various cohomologies and homologies I've introduced are the same thing. So we, if we can compute on the Sharpley complex, then we can compute Hecke this way. So the conclusion is that our papers don't compute group cohomology or compute X W mod gamma. Technically, technically we compute Sharpley homology. However, it's all the same thing in the torsion-free cases, and we study it. And we'll tell you what's going on at p equals 2, 3, and 5. That's fine. All right, so, um, so now let me tell you some ways that we, some algorithms we have that do compute the HECA operators in practice in this setting. Um, so the, um, it's nicest for us in the top degree of the virtual cohomological dimension. 
because um, chase through all the dimensions, that corresponds to zero Sharblees. Basically, there you're computing with these Sharblees that are square matrices, not rectangular matrices. So of course that's easier. And for n equals two and three, that is in fact the cuspid <coughs> arrangement. Um, okay, now it's a fact about the well-rounded retract that you have to check that all the well-rounded zero Sharblees, all the square matrices you're gonna get from the well-rounded case, they're all gonna have determinant one. This is not true at n equals five anymore, and, and uh, when you go higher, it, it's rather spectacularly not true. But so it, we'll have to rethink this part of our work when we, if we go to HEC operators for SL5, but we're not doing that these days. Okay. Now, as I said, HEC correspondences are gonna carry these matrices to things of determinant much larger than one part, some function of L. But uh, Ash and Rudolph, back in 1979, came up with an algorithm of the following form. You, you take a symbol of, with a matrix A in it of a determinant bigger than one, and you can write it as a finite sum of other symbols, and this will be a, um, a homology in Sharbly homology, so you're not changing the Sharbly homology class. But the determinants of all these things here have decreased, that's what they prove. So of course you do it recursive, no, you do it recursively, you uh, break A down into these, and then you break down these down further into a bigger sum, the determinants keep going down. Eventually, they'll all hit one and stop. And then it turns out those are all well-rounded Sharblees. So you, you see what we've got. We've got, we take the cell complex we can compute with, hit it with a heck operator. It's now in this complex of rational matrices. But you work through this algorithm, and it walks itself back. And finally, you're back to the cells in our complex W again. So we use this algorithm a lot. It's, for those who know modular symbols for SL2, this is very much a generalization of modular symbols. Um, and for that matter, all these algorithms in, in a sense are generalization of continued fractions. So. All right, now uh, like I said, we're, we wanna compute with cohomology in the cuspidal degrees. Um, unfortunately for n equals four, although the top degree is H6, which is what Ash Rudolph could do, the cuspidal range is H5 and H4, so one and two down. So we needed an algorithm f for degree minus one. So Paul Gunnels came up with an algorithm w for this. Um, so, um, it, so H5 is one Sharble is using four by five matrices. Okay, um, I, I was state that these one Sharble is, the well-rounded ones have a certain structure. They're all SL4Z equivalent to one of these. You take a, um, you can, you can always reduce the four by f five matrices so that they have an identity matrix on the left, and then either two ones, three ones, or four ones on the right, and those are the equivalent types. If you check through these matrices, you could check all four by four subdeterminants are either zero or one. Okay. Now you hit these things with HECA, <coughs> and you get rational matrices whose subdeterminants are not zero or one. They're some like function of L. But so, um, Gunnels uses essentially a detailed study of these kind of four by five matrices and their subdeterminants to reduce it. It's and if you want to describe it geometrically, you've got cells in a complex, and he has to go, you know, to get sharply boundaries. He has to go one degree higher. So it's the metaphors are things like you have a house and you're building roofs and walls on the house, and you have to add roofs and walls to get other cycles to cancel out, and. Um, Interestingly, he, um, to make certain things reduce, he doesn't make determinants reduce per se. He uses the LLL, the lens to lovash lattice reduction algorithm to make certain subdeterminants smaller. And he, he's never gotten a proof that this will always work or always converge, but in a 50 to 20 years, it has never failed. So yeah, we're, life is good. Um, okay. um, but as mentioned, those, those <laughs> algorithms you know, only work in certain degrees, the top degree or one away from the top. So one, uh, one would like an algorithm that works in um, all degrees i. So, um, so I, Bob McPherson and I have uh, been working on that and, and uh, made some progress, especially in the last year or two. Um, in principle, this works again for uh, g as any restriction of scalars for gln for any number field k. And in principle, it works for any n. Um, yeah, 
when one also has to consider what one does in practice. So uh, for, for, um, for me, the test of a complicated algorithm is working code. Like I wasn't going to feel comfortable about this until I had working code, at least for SL2 and SL3. Um, so we don't have a preprint, but we have working code. And when you have working code, the preprint, you've got to get to that and do it soon. OK, so, I will, um, so I'll assume SLNZ and just n equals 2 and 3 for the rest of this exposition of what we're doing. So this algorithm that works in all degrees is called the well-tempered retract, not the um, well-rounded retract. OK, so um, because then we're going to fix a lattice L in, uh, in n dimensions, fix a prime L and for um, simplicity, just let it not divide n, fix k from 1 to n. I'm going to fix one of these sublattices M of L for which uh, the quotient is isomorphic to Z mod LZ. You'll see that all the sublattices M eventually come back in because we're going to do the uh, two maps thing. Um, so um, the distinguishing feature of this algorithm is there's a real parameter T. There's a knob that you could turn from U to 0 to L. And this knob called the uh, temperament, I think Tony Bari for giving us the, the hint that maybe Bach would be a good thing to use for this name. Um, so the whole idea is to, is to lie about the length of your vectors. But if you're in a bad mood, you say, I'm lying about the length of my vectors. If, if you're in a good mood, you say, I'm tempering them. Um, so we make a definition of, remember, I fix a lattice L and a fix sub lattice M. So a vector y and L has tempered length t times longer than what the actual length is if y is not in the sublattice, and it has length equal to what the real length is if y is in the sublattice. So um, the idea is if t equals 1, you could do the old well-rounded retraction just the same way. If t is huge, then every point that's not in M is being told lies about it. it's reporting that its length is extremely large. So when you start retracting and asking who's the shortest vector, you'll only ever see shortest vectors coming from M. So for very large T, in fact, you can prove L is the bound, all you're doing is making the M well-rounded and the, the vectors of L are just sort of being ignored. When T is 1, as I said, you're making L itself well-rounded the way we were before. So for T values in between, you're uh, you're doing some kind of intermediate retraction where as t grows, different vectors from L will like start falling out of the picture, and different vectors from M will come into the picture. So it, it continuously interpolates between these two cases. So we do well-rounded retraction with this tempered notion. We do it in each t slice separately, so we get tilde w, uh, the uh, well-tempered retract. It lives in x cross. The, the time interval 1 to L. Um, I'll denote the slice uh, W tilde sub T. And um, the gamma action preserves slices, because gamma is, gamma is acting by permuting things in the lattice. And so on. And time is sort of acting independently of that. OK. So I don't know if it sounds like this could, well, I, I wanted to say that the, um, the heck operator is then defined by the exact same picture of the, of the two maps. With a, going down, it's just, if the coset up here is you know, g times the subgroup, then you go down here to g gamma, and you go here to g t gamma. Okay. So the way I describe this well-tempered retract, I don't know if it sounds like it's computable at all. But okay. here's one thing that hasn't um, come up yet in the talk. So s there's the whole range of Riemannian symmetric spaces coming from the different uh, so Lie groups, if you put it that way. And, but some of the symmetric spaces, particularly those for SLN, come equipped with linear coordinates. The, I guess the full list is the one, are the ones that were studied in Ash, Mumford, Rappaport, and Tai, where you do this, you, you study the, uh, the cones coming from Jordan algebras. But for today, let's just say the symmetric spaces for SLN. Because the symmetric space for SLN is the space of positive definite matrices, modular homothetes. So that's, that's an, you take um, positive definite symmetric matrices, that's yeah, n times n plus 1 over 2 variables, and it's an open set in there. 
I'm, I'm drawing a contrast between, say, the symmetric space for SP2NR. For SP2NR, I would have uh, like, uh, you know, quadratic polynomial conditions on these x's given by uh, the columns of the matrix have to satisfy the, uh, the relations of the symplectic form. So, so quadratic polynomials would be, in the symplectic case, they're cutting out something within this open set. But for SLN, it's just an open set. So you have flat, like, R, well, not Rn, but R of this dimension coordinates that you can work with. So you've got flat coordinates in that many dimensions crossed with one more coordinate of time, so it's linear. So, and then the, the fact of the, the main computational result that we've proved is that at least a bounded subset of this thing can be computed just as a big linear programming problem in these linear variables. And the trick is one more variable, which is not t, but it's, you have to use t squared because it's a squared length. And then if you do one over it, the formulas work out right and become linear. So um, Bob and I were actually began working on this in 94, 95, and a long time ago, and had the ideas. One uh, issue for a computationalist is back in 94, 95, you couldn't just go to your favorite open source software package and say, OK, do some linear programming for me. Or, I mean, you could, certainly couldn't go to it and say, OK, I'm thinking, like for n equals 3, I'm thinking of a seven-dimensional space. I've got a polytope on 60-some thousand vertices. I think that's correct. And tell me all the facets. And it comes back and says, yeah, well, there's a few hundred thousand facets. I think maybe, I think it's 150,000 facets or maybe more. So you, you can fortunately do that today. You couldn't do it in 94, 95. Um, the way you do it is I use SAGE, the open source system uh, pioneered by William Stein. Um, there's a class polyhedron in there working over, I forgot to check which he uses by default, but I know at least a CDD is a leading package that SAGE has wrapped to do this kind of uh, linear programming work. Uh, technically, we're not using W till these uh, well-rounded root texts, as you see from the pictures, they're sort of concave, they're like graphs and things retract into them. That's not good for linear programming. Um, so we use a dual, in, that's uh, the world of Voronoi polyhedra, and the dual thing I call the hecatope, obviously. Um, it's worth mentioning that um, this W tilde, this, this is all expensive. So uh, if you want to compute the operator TLK, you have to construct a W tilde for L and K. Okay. Then if you want to compute another hop heck operator for a different L and K, you've got to do another linear programming problem and construct another one of these. But we've, you know, we've done several. Um, clearly a question is, you're doing a linear program problem to get a lot of cells of some cell complex. And then at the end, you're going to say, well, modulo gamma, I had a complete set of representatives of all the cells I need. And the question is, how do you know how much to take? Well, um, you know, if, if you're doing, you know, there are Minkowski bounds on lattices, the Hamid constant. That gives you some bounds. Those are much too big for in practice. In work, it's work in progress to determine tamer bounds for now. I'm just sort of guessing. Okay, well, so that um, so that concludes I, that concludes what I'm going to say about computational techniques per se. So I went over how to compute the cohomology, which was quizzical coefficients, and three different algorithms for HECA. Now tr I'll try to um, say a bit about the results. So, of course, I haven't even introduced Galois representations yet. So um, we're because of you know being computationalists. I mean. Galois representations are often take, take their image in uh, matrices, matrix rings over QP, but when we don't want to compete with QP. We want to compete with Z mod P, or um, of course, you can have finite extensions, so you'd be computing over a finite field. So that's what we do. Let F be a finite field of characteristic P. Our representations then will have take their image in like some kind of GLN of F. So um, Hecke algebra, commutative algebra. So we have. Hecke eigenclasses, say in degree i, let a l k be the Hecke eigenvalue. Then um, rho will be how I denote a Galois representation, a representation of the absolute Galois group into GLN f, semi simple and continuous. Um, so a definition is then that the Galois representation rho is attached to the topological class Z if 
for every L not dividing the P and the N, the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius for the representation is this uh, classic polynomial. With, it's got the Hecke eigenvalue in there and so on, f familiar from the L functions and all. Uh, now there's another definition, rho seems to be attached to your class. So if that's, it seems to be attached if it holds for enough L that you're confident of the result. Um, and when n, is l when n is small, I mean some, in our recent project we've gotten as high as at least T17-1 for SL4 when we really had to, to like uniquely identify a row. So I, I didn't even know that we could get to T17-1, but we could. Um, when the level n gets larger, it's harder to compute Hecke. I'm talking about Gunnell's algorithm now. So um, what you hope at least is that um, your computer is big enough you can compute the Hecke, these Hecke polynomials for a f the first few L, get enough to, so that it seems that you've got a unique row that could be attached to your cohomology class. And then if you can compute a couple more Ls and say, oh, this Hecke polynomial is still attached, then you say, wow, that's wonderful confirmation. And, okay. So, so now I'll try to summarize result. Um, there's there's many years of papers here and lots of results, and um, so I, I can't summarize them all, even for Ash and his collaborators. I, was, I apologize. I'm not saying anything about work of others. You know, the game in the top, the um, Albert Vincent and Soule working on GL8 and things. I'm, for the reasons of ignorance of the speaker, I'm just sort of sticking to the to the story I'm telling here. Um, so, um, so to try to summarize though, so first Ash and his collaborators have many papers on SL3 because you know we have a Hecke algorithm that works at the top degree, which is the cusp of the degree there. So in these papers you look at various different, kind of, there's, you can look at the constant coefficient modules, you can twist by Dirichlet characters. Uh, they have papers on the uh, very symmetric algorithm algebras on the, um, on the three variables for a range of R. And uh, usually they, you try to give the um, Hecke operators and the Hecke eigenvalues for a range of L, which usually much larger than we can do here. And, um, and then the report on the row that seemed to be attached. One, uh, one of these papers, probably the first one I'll mention because it's going to come up later, is the paper of Ash, Grayson, and Green in J number of theory in 1984. So for the First time with this kind of computation, they found a cuspidal cohomology in H3 for the congruent subgroups of SL3Z. And um, they were doing constant coefficients over C. And so it comes up in 53, 61, 79, and 89. And Yasaki and I have found more since, but you know, yeah. there's lots. Okay. So uh, when not much time remaining, so I'm going to focus on reporting on uh, what Ashton Gunnels and I have done on it on the cuspidal cohomology H5 for SL4 for various subgroups gamma naught of n. So it's a, a series of six papers since uh, after 2000. And the seventh paper is in press. We've, we've finished gathering data for the seventh paper, and now we just got to write it. So to, to summarize these papers, um, we mostly looked at constant coefficients m. We also mostly looked at constant coefficients in characteristic zero. Now, characteristic zero what I mean by that is uh, it's always harder to compute in floating point because you've got to prove that you're, you know, there's rank instability and things like that. So um, after our first paper, we started using large primes to stand in for the complexes. So F12379 is our standard stand in for C because that's 12379 is the fourth prime after 12345. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, over the years, we've computed this cohomology for all levels n up to 56, and then the composite ones take longer, so then we abandoned them and did prime level up to 211. So um, the largest sparse matrix I had to do on a, a laptop this size and running Windows, which I've learned since is much worse for this work, was a, a million by four million. So um, just to say a bit about the computations, you, the, you know, all, the, all this work uses very sparse matrices. That means there's many, many cells in our complexes, but each cell only touches a few others. So typically, um, like our largest matrix was one million by four million, but like in each row or column, only about 20 things were non-zero. So that, can, that fits in a computer memory, but when you start doing row reduction or related algorithms, 
the sparsity fills in. As you do one row operation, you start adding a lot of new entries where there were zeros before. So the, uh, the tricks are to avoid fill-in, but we, uh, we developed tricks that were successful in that. Um, torsion is of interest, especially with the uh, recent conjecture of Mejron Venkatesh, and, and, and we've uh, looked at that also with, with our computations. Um, for SO4, we don't have that much torsion. I, I was often doing computations over Z, not over FP and not over C, but over Z itself. So, um, so we got a few torsion classes of that way, and then we also did work on these sort of bad primes. More recently, and what I'm going to talk about in the remaining minutes is uh, <coughs> we said enough with constant coefficients, let's do all the Nabin types. So that means all one-dimensional representations, but uh, you know, gamma naught of n has a, excuse me, has a bottom right corner mod n, and uh, so you could take all Dirichlet characters on that bottom right corner, taking values in your field f. Of course, you choose f to be able to receive all those characters. Beginner. Um, so we've finished that work now. We've did all levels up to 28, prime levels up to 41. I'll tell you later why we stopped at 41. Let's see. So we call this um, the equality I mentioned before. So we, we split the left side for H5 in the cuspidal range. We split it up by our um, into heck eigenspaces by all the L's we can compute. And um, in this Nabin type project, in this current project, each eigenspace always seems to be attached to a Gower representation that we recognize. And in fact, we, um, we decided to spend a couple more years on this project because we, we decided we wanted to prove a uniqueness result. So we have a list of Gower representations we're looking for, which are likely candidates given the behavior of the borel serre boundary. And we decided to prove there's we get unique rows that appear to be attached to what we find. And we have, we have done so, modulo some cases where like a symmetric square happened to be equal to another one. We, we have got uniqueness. I would say we partly understand the splitting on the right-hand side. We, we would like to say that we have s some insight into how Eisenstein cohomology takes the classes on the right side and lifts them to the left side. It's, other than tentatively, we can't say that, but we've certainly thought about it and made, uh, made proposals. Okay, um, the uh, frowny face thing is that um, Abner likes to say that a cohomology class is autochthonous if it's cuspidal on your group and it's not a functorial lifting from any lower rank group. So we would love to find cuspidal cohomology on SL4 that's not a lifting from GSP4 or something. We have now found it yet. We keep computing and, you know, that's so sad. Okay. Well, let's see. Let me say briefly what, what things we are searching for. So th the main things we're searching for are guided by, um, again, the cohomology of the borel serre boundary where you're getting, on the, on the boundary components, you're often getting lists from the cohomology of SL2 or more rarely SL3. So that led us to look for the following list of Gower representations. So, Sort of long, let me go through this quickly. Um, first, you want a bunch of one-dimensional Gower representations. So take any Dirichlet character on Z mod NZ with coefficients in your big enough field. Also, um, let epsilon be the cyclotomic character for P. Then uh, look at all possible types of products of chi with epsilon, the powers up to 0, 1, 2, and 3 of the cyclotomic character. I'll say more about that. Then we also see a lot of Gower representations coming from the classical holomorphic modular forms. So for um, take any divisor of n, take any uh, neighbor type character for that n1, take any classical new form for n1 of that neighbor type in weights 2, 3, and 4. And that gives a Gower representation with a you know, well-known Hecker polynomial and so forth. This is a Gower re representation in characteristic zero. That, I mean, the classical modular form, we haven't pushed it to mod p yet. So uh, it's defined over some cyclotomic field. I think I'm seeing minimal polynomials at degree 96 for the last few we've been doing. Um, how are you going to, you can't just map those to your finite field. You have to make sure your finite field is big enough. So here's what I meant by big enough. You have to look at what this field is. Look at primes in there. You would like to find primes p of this field that split completely. Well, you can at least in general with five-digit primes, they just aren't enough. So um, instead, we, um, 
we look at those that split as much as possible and then enlarge, you know, so that's particularly inert, and we enlarge F prime to hold the inert stuff. So once we've done that, the Agawa representation maps into this. Okay. So we look at the set of all such my peak Agawa representations are in that field, and we also look at their symmetric squares. Now I've just given you a long list of Gower representations. You um, basically tensor them together in all possible ways and then take direct sums of those tensor products until you add up to db4. And you'd like to say that there's only one of those attached to each Hecke eigenclass that we compute. And we are always finding that. Okay. Some um, highlights. Because the cuspel, the AGG, the Ash Grayson Green classes also show up. Um, for twisted coefficients, there's a class that was known at level 41 that showed up, and that's why we've de decided to stop at level 41. We did get some cuspidal cohomology, it's just not autochthonous. So we get some lifts from uh, holomorphic Ziegel modular forms of weight 3 on GSP4 that lift up into H5 cusp of SL4. Um, so I Ibukiyama prepared tables of these things coming from the uh, paramodular subgroups, and they, they match our data. Gritsenko found a l certain lifts from uh, Jacobi forms as equal modular forms. Turns out the ones he's lifting aren't ours, so ours are coming from somewhere else, and we're, we've, we feel about where. Um, the cus forms of weight four that we get, they don't always, um, w we don't get all cus forms of weight four appearing in our list. It, our data suggests that it's where the central special value of the, uh, the L function vanishes, that then we see those classes in our results and not otherwise, or why. Um, and finally, the, um, if we had an Eisenstein series in infinity and restricted to the uh, inertia subgroup, it would look like epsilon plus epsilon, or epsilon to the zero plus epsilon one plus epsilon two plus epsilon three. We, we see that behavior persisting. It's an analog of Sarah's conjecture. But it's five after five, so uh, I believe I'll stop now. So thank you, and any questions?